what the Bible teaches and Baptists verily believe. This is topic 15, the moral nature of man. Preachers used to say that the materials in the human body had been analyzed and their worth came to about 98 cents. Then in 1980, an almanac raised the figure to $7.28. Recently, the Los Angeles Times reported that just seven of the chemicals in the human body were worth $169,834. Well, we're making progress or else inflation is worse than we thought. But the worth of a man can never be determined by the worth of his body. We must ask, what is the worth of a human mind? What is the value of a human soul? Man is a moral creature. By this we mean that he's responsible for his actions. There's one of the marks, and this is one of the marks by which man is distinguished from the beast. Man is constituted a moral creature by those faculties which make him responsible for his actions. These faculties are three. First, the intellect. Thomas, Thomas Akempis, born 1380 and passed away at 1471 A.D., medieval theologian and author of The Imitation of Christ, once said, Intelligence must follow faith, never precede it, and never destroy it. The intellect is the faculty of perception or thought. It is man's power of knowing or receiving knowledge. Without intellect, man would not be a moral creature. This is taught by Jesus in John 9.41. Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should know no sin. But now you say, We see. Therefore your sin remaineth. The second faculty of sin is conscience. Oswald Chambers, Scottish Baptist evangelist, best known for his devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest, once said, Conscience is that faculty in me which attaches itself to the highest that I know and tells me what the highest I know demands that I do. It is the eye of the soul which looks out either toward God or toward what it regards as its highest authority. If I'm in the habit of steadily facing toward God, my conscience will always introduce God's perfect law and indicate what I should do. The point is, will I obey? I have to make an effort to keep my conscience so sensitive that I walk without offense. I should be living in such perfect sympathy with God's Son that in every circumstance, the spirit of my mind is renewed. The one thing that keeps the conscience sensitive to Him is the habit of being open to God on the inside. When there is any debate, quit. There is no debate possible when conscience speaks. From a strictly psychological standpoint, conscience is not regarded as a separate faculty. From this standpoint, the three faculties are intellect, sensibility, and will. The conscience being regarded as the combined action of these faculties, giving man a consciousness of his moral responsibility and judging between right and wrong. Yet, conscience can, in a sense, be regarded as a faculty, for it is the power of the mind to know right from wrong and to feel obligated obligated to do the right. This judgment is involved in conscience. And reason is involved in judgment. 
After all, conscience is man's ultimate guide. It is unsound to make a distinction between the following one's conscience and following the law of God. The law of God has no way of reaching us except through conscience. When we do right, it can only be as a result of the prompting of the conscience. Conscience acts according to the stand standard accepted by the mind. Thus, conscience guides us aright only in the proportion to the rightness of the standard we have accepted as our guide. Hence the need of correct knowledge of the Word of God. The third faculty of man is will. Spurgeon said, willful pigs go forward if you pull them back. He said, the more you say they shall not, the more they will invite them and they will not come. Refuse them admittance and a regiment of soldiers could not keep them out. The will of man is defined by Augustus H. Strong as the soul's power to choose between motives and to direct its subsequent activity according to the motive thus chosen. In other words, the soul's power to choose both an end and the means to attain it. The same author says the choice of an ultimate end we call imminent preference. The choice of means we call executive volition. As we've remarked in considering God's will, the will is not independent of the nature of its possessor. It is not, as it were, another self within us. The character of the will is the character of the individual possessing it. The will is simply a power of the soul. The acts of the will are determined by two factors, motives and character. We use the term motives to mean reasons and inducements influencing toward certain acts of the will. Of these two factors, character is the most dominant. For in every act of the will, we make choice between two or more motives. And it is our character that determines which motive we choose. Every act of the will is an expression of character in view of motives. And every act of the will tends to modify or confirm character. This explains why a given choice of the will becomes easier and easier each time it is made. The question of the freedom of man's will, being such a broad subject, will be treated in another chapter, another topic. The first duty of man. Sir Thomas More, while a prisoner in the Tower of London by King Henry VIII, would not suffer his hair to be trimmed, saying, there was a controversy between the king and him for his head. Until that was at an happy end, he would be at no cost about it. The first work of man should be to settle the controversy between himself and God concerning his soul. Victory over the natural man. An illiberal Christian was listening to a sermon on Christian giving. He was nearly deaf and was accustomed to sitting facing the congregation right under the pulpit where his ear trumpet directed, directed upward toward the preacher. The sermon moved him considerably. At one time he said to himself, I'll give ten dollars. And again he said, I'll give fifteen. And by the close of the sermon he was very much moved and thought he might give fifty dollars. Now the offering plates were passed. And as they moved along, his charity began to ooze out. He came down from 50 to 20 to 10 to 5 and to 0. 
he concluded that he would not give anything. Yet he said, this won't do. I'm in a bad fix. My hopes of heaven may be in this question. This covetousness will be my ruin. The offering plate was getting nearer and nearer. The crisis was upon him. What should he do? The plate was now under his chin, and all the congregation was looking. He had been holding his billfold in his hand during this soliloquy, which was half audible, though in his deafness he did not know that he was heard by the others. In the agony of the final moment, he took his entire billfold and laid it on the offering plate, saying to himself as he did it, Now squirm, old nature. Well, with that, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, ever since man chose the fruit of the tree of the Garden of Eden, and even Adam ate of that tree, they cease to be the children of God. And now we have the nature of Adam coming down through our own to his DNA to us, so that we're all born sinners. And our nature is not godly, but it's a sinful nature. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus Christ that came and died for our sins on the cross, so that could we could be reborn. And so, that instead of Satan, Heavenly Father, you now are our Father. And we are the children of God. Members of the family of God. Because we've been born into your family. And we thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. And we must confess that none of it was our will. None of it came for our, from our nature, but it was the drawing of the Holy Spirit of God and the wooing of Jesus Christ that convinced us that we were sinners and that we needed to be saved. We needed to be born into the kingdom of God. Bless all that are under the sound of my voice this evening and give us a great day on Sunday when we continue the sermons on eschatology or the doctrine of last things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.